So I want to welcome everyone to uh, today's seminar. Um, it's a special research seminar we have today. We're very pleased to have with us our speaker, Dr. Sanjeev uh, Sinha. Dr. Sinha is an uh, assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Science and Engineering here at the U of I. Um, professor Sinha investigates electrothermal transport in nanostructures, semiconductor physics, and closed pack nanocrystal assemblies. His research interests are um, in diverse thermal transport uh, phenomena at small length and time scales and at low temperatures. He has recently investigated the physics of heat flow at atomistic uh, levels to improve the reliability of nanoelectronics and to engineer materials with novel thermal physical properties. His research uh, will greatly enhance engineer energy efficiency and power delivery at the micro scale and facilitate greater innovation in microarchitecture of computers. He recently co-invented a method for making substrates with thermally conductive structures as well as resulting uh, embedded carbon nanotube uh, heat spreader substrate. Um, Dr. Sinha uh, received his PhD in mechanical engineering at Stanford University his um, MS degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford, and his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology. So please welcome Dr. Sinha. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. First of all, uh, really thanks to Manohar for particularly for inviting me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be at ISTC. I've heard a little bit about ISTC from Manohar, so it's uh, Great opportunity to see you guys uh, you know, in person. Um, I'm with the mechanical science and engineering department here, and often when the department was renamed mechanical science and engineering, uh, our peers at other places sometimes think of it as a gimmick. But uh, hopefully this talk will emphasize why we put science in that department. Um, the work we do in our research group is really at the crossroads of science and engineering. And both are really necessary to make the breakthroughs that we are trying to make. You can't do one without the other, really. So the topic I'm going to focus on today is uh, geared towards waste heat recovery. Uh, but we are mostly focused on the materials and devices to do this in the solid state. So in the solid state, energy conversion can be facilitated using what are called thermoelectric materials. So a thermoelectric material converts heat directly to electricity all in the solid state. There is no physical fluid involved as a working fluid. The working fluid in this case are the electrons and holes, or so the charge carriers in the semiconductor. So the first thing is the motivation for doing all this. And the motivation is pretty robust. This is uh, an annual energy flow chart put together by uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and what you have on the left-hand side are the sources of energy as used uh, in the United States. So this is all domestic U.S. consumption per year. This happens to be the data for 2009. All the units are in quadrillion BTUs. So the total energy consumption in 2009 was about 95 quads. And this is the breakup of the sources. Now, this is how energy is being used and the waste mechanisms, etc. But if you jump on the right-hand side, this is where you end up. So out of the energy that's used, 55 quads out of 95 quads is just being wasted as heat. So this is total reduction. And the thermodynamicist in the audience will recognize that although I have 55 quads, it doesn't mean I can do a lot of work with that 55 quads necessarily. So if you look at the exergy that's still available at this, even if you assume that all this is just at 100 degrees centigrade, which is not true, actually much, much of the a substantial portion of this rejected energy is at a much higher temperature. So there is sufficient temperature potential to actually extract additional work out of this. So why do we not do that today? Well, look at the sources of these waste heat. Okay. Uh, power plants are run fairly efficiently, and there are waste heat recovery systems uh, already in place, but there's still some potential left. The biggest chunk is in automobiles. So here you have a compact system for transportation, and the temperature at the exhaust manifold of an engine weighs anywhere from 400 to 600 degrees centigrade. 
and by the time it gets to the tailpipe, it's 100 to 200 degrees centigrade, just been exhausted out. Okay. Then there are uh, you know more exotic applications like data centers, which are upcoming, increasing in number, and again the temperature at the exit after being warmed up by the heat produced in the servers goes anywhere from 50 to 100 degrees centigrade. They are meant to run very warm these days. Okay. Then there's geothermal. Well, a lot of the sources, if you look at this, just six kilometers under the ground are actually at relatively low temperatures. You can't run a steam ranking cycle at these temperatures. So overall, if you look at this, um, the problem is more technological. You have waste heat, but you can't get work out of it at a cost-effective manner. Okay. So fluid machines, which provide uh, the most cost-effective work conversion, are just infeasible at these temperatures. Okay. And if you look at the other options involving fluid machines, you would have to do transcritical carbon dioxide cycles, organic ranking, Kalina, ammonia-based cycles, all of which have some problems or the other and end up being very expensive. So thermoelectrics is one another option in this list of options. Okay, and it's very distinct from everything else put up there. It's all solid state energy conversion, but it's also plagued by difficulties which go back almost, you know, a decade, a hundred years or more. So the origin of thermoelectrics goes back to the work of Johann Zebeck in Germany in the 1820s when he discovered what's called, what's called the Zebeck effect in his honor. Um, basically, the effect is that if I have two metals in contact and the junction is placed at a different temperature than the other ends of the metal, I develop a voltage across this and this is the principle that's used in a thermocouple for temperature measurements. It's very widely used all over the place. So this, was, this effect was actually discovered in the 1820s and the Seebeck voltage that's generated from the junction of two metals in contact like that is dependent on the temperature difference. Okay? The voltage is directly proportional to the temperature difference between two ends and the proportionality constant is what we call the Seebeck coefficient. Now the Seebeck coefficient at a microscopic level is a ratio of two currents. It's a ratio of the entropy that an electron carries with it to the charge that an electron carries with it. Okay? So the entropy current carried by an electron scales as the Boltzmann constant Kb and the charge is just the fundamental charge E. So Seebeck coefficient is basically the ratio of K and E. And if you work out the numbers, this works out to be about 100 microvolts per Kelvin. So Seebeck voltage is going to be a small voltage all right, for a small temperature difference such as this. So one Kelvin, you're going to get about 100 microvolts. So if you're thinking of harvesting this as a battery, you need to have many, many cells in series to be able to extract, let's say, one volt out of it. Typically, Metals are actually much worse than this. Metals are only a few tens of uh, microvolts per Kelvin. But semiconductors go all the way from uh, 100, 200 microvolts per Kelvin to 1,000 microvolts per Kelvin. So semiconductors is, uh, you know, is a better option in trying to use thermoelectrics for waste heat recovery. So how does this work? A typical thermoelectric device looks like this. This is called a pi leg junction. And it basically has two elements. One is an n-type semiconductor. So n-type meaning that the semiconductor uh, carries charge via electrons. And a p-type semiconductor, which means that the semiconductor carries charge via holes, the absence of electrons. Okay. So you take two, n uh, two semiconductors, one of the n-type, one of the p-type, and you form a metallic junction on one side. And then you have these two other metallic junctions. So these are the contacts. Now, when a temperature difference is applied across the end, so let's imagine this is heated up on the bottom side, then electrons in the n-type semiconductor will gain more energy on this side and they will start diffusing. This is just mass diffusion. As the electrons diffuse to the other side, a potential develops. Okay, this is the Seebeck effect. On the other side, there are holes, so the electrons actually are moving in the opposite direction down there. So now, effectively, you have a current that flows such as this in this device. If I connect these two ends across a resistor, I will see a current flowing in this manner through this device. Okay. 
Now, overall, the efficiency of this, and we'll revisit this in a few slides, is given by a combination of material parameters. So overall, first of all, when you think about this, the efficiency gain that you seek to achieve for this kind of energy conversion lies in the material. That's the first uh, you know, problem that arises. It becomes a materials level problem. So then efficient thermoelectrics becomes a search for efficient thermoelectric materials, first of all. Unless you have a good material, there's nothing you can do with this effect much. Now, ever since the discovery of SABIC, there has been a constant effort to make thermoelectric generators. So you're talking 1820s. There's nothing new about this. Okay. Um, in fact, some of the experiments done by Ohm of the fame of Ohm's law were done with thermoelectric generators supplying the power source. Okay, those were not galvanic cells. So this has been around for a long time, and especially in uh, the Soviet Union in the 1920s, uh, work done by Yoffe, et etc., really laid the foundation for thermoelectric generators. And you could find these kilowatt scale uh, thermoelectric generators where you would burn fuel, get that heat into a device, and generate electricity from this. And you could do this in very remote locations. Uh, in the modern version of, uh, you know, in the United States, the application has mostly been uh, for space. Uh, in particular, NASA did a lot of development work, and all the uh, Voyager missions, etc., have been powered by thermoelectric generators. These are silicon germanium generators, so they've been around for a while, but they have mostly been for exotic applications. If you look at how things stand today, there are actually a couple at least a couple, if not more, commercial companies that are trying to commercialize thermoelectrics to enter you know, a big enough commercial space. So this is a thermoelectric generator, um, you know, an example of a thermoelectric generator made by this company, BSST. Uh, this is a company incorporated in California. There's another one called Amerigon, and these are the two main companies today. Um, so again, looking at the application space, uh, there's power generation, uh, which has mostly been for uh, satellites. And now the same kind of technology is trying to work its way into automotive uh, waste heat recovery systems. So uh, there is an effort by BMW. It started with BMW, but now it has spread to uh, other manufacturers, Ford, GM, etc. Almost everybody is looking into thermoelectrics uh, to try and put one of these in their vehicles. And the objective is to get... Uh, a mileage improvement, miles, miles per gallon improvement, anywhere from 1% to 10%. But 10% is kind of the upper limit. But if you think about a waste weight recovery for an automobile, it needs to be lightweight, compact, lots of things that fluid machines cannot deliver. So this happens to be a very promising technology. The thing is to make it work robustly enough that it can go in an automobile. Uh, there are other applications. So in the inverse uh, process, uh, the Sebeck effect becomes the Peltier effect. So the Peltier effect, you would run a current through a thermoelectric material, and it would actually pump heat out, just like a refrigeration cycle would. Okay. So you can actually buy these things in Walmart. So this is a higher, uh, small refrigerator with uh, Peltier coolers in it. Uh, Peltier coolers have been devised and developed a lot by the uh, military for night vision goggles, etc. So they are an integral part of any CCD element which senses you know, all these uh, infrared radiation. And today, uh, there's this company in California, Merigon, which is making uh, you know, uh, heated and cooled seats, which have Peltier coolers embedded in them. So these are now spreading out from luxury automobiles to you know, working their way down towards more, uh, more commercial mass-produced automobiles. So overall, uh, in all of these applications, the thermoelectric conversion is still Carnot limited. It operates just like a heat engine would. So here's an illustration of how this works. So you have a hot junction and a cold junction. Uh, so there's a temperature difference being applied across the device. So heat flows in and then out of the device. The temperature difference, which is driving the whole process, so this is equivalent of a cell where the voltage depends upon the temperature difference. Okay, there's no chemistry involved. The temperature difference uh, works inversely as the thermal conductivity. So overall, if I want to have a large temperature difference across my device, I'm looking for a low thermal conductivity to have 
a sizable delta t. In response to this delta t as I just described you will develop a Seebeck voltage which is going to be proportional to this delta t times the Seebeck coefficient s. So this is the voltage in the cell in open circuit now if I connect if I want work out of it there is zero work at this stage I connect this across a resistor and I get current to flow okay. As the current flows through the device it will dissipate joule heat because this has a finite resistivity uh, because of that you lose some part of the energy that would otherwise be converted to work okay. So this is a dissipative it is a parasitic effect. So effectively what you are looking for is a material with low thermal conductivity to give you a large temperature difference you are looking for a material with high Seebeck coefficient to give you a large voltage in response to that temperature and finally you are looking for a material with low resistivity so that you do not lose energy as joule heat when a current is run through the device okay. So the combination of these three parameters forms the fundamental problem of thermoelectrics. So this is perfectly equivalent to a mechanical uh, heat engine where which, which uh, I am sure most of you are very familiar and the Carnot efficiency of this would be 1 minus T cold by T hot. So this device also is limited by the Carnot efficiency but in addition its efficiency is the Carnot efficiency times uh, this factor which is a purely materials driven factor and it involves this parameter called ZT where Z is a material parameter times T which is the average temperature of this device and Z is given by the Seebeck squared times electrical conductivity divided by the thermal conductivity kappa okay. So just from the, con from the discussion that we had previously the higher the Seebeck the greater the voltage the higher the electrical conductivity the less the loss in the system because of joule heating and the lower the thermal conductivity the greater the temperature difference and greater the voltage that is being generated okay. So effectively S square sigma by K which is Z controls the efficiency of energy conversion by thermoelectrics. So overall where we stand today is uh, the best material arguably is bismuth telluride and as you are aware probably tellurium is a rare earth element so this is not a very commonly uh, available material. So this is a rare earth material it provides a ZT of 1 about approximately 1 at room temperature and even at 1 the efficiency of conversion is very little. So we are not looking at 10 percent 20 percent efficiencies of conversion using thermoelectrics rather we are looking at something between 1 to 5 percent okay. But you can do this with an energy source just a little bit above room temperature and you cannot do anything else with that waste heat all right. So even with a low efficiency looking at the amount of heat produced that is available the overall conversion even at a low efficiency can be can result in sufficient electricity being generated. So overall the problem that we grapple with is how to increase this Z from as I said the ZT best value of ZT today around room temperature is 1 and we want to boost it to about 3. At 3 it starts meeting and beating some of the uh, fluid cycles that we are familiar with. Now increasing Z has proven to be a very very tough problem and the reason for that is because these three parameters are very intricately linked at a microscopic scale you cannot fiddle with one without affecting the other one all right. So let us see what happens so this is uh, you know just a schematic of what happens if I take a semiconductor and I start doping it and doping is essentially the process of introducing a foreign atom into so let us say we take silicon and we put an atom of phosphorus in it. So phosphorus with a valency of 5 will release one electron and that will dope or it will convert the silicon with one extra electron and it becomes an n type semiconductor okay. So the charge carrier in majority are electrons in an n type silicon. So as I increase the doping and I increase the carrier concentration number of electrons in the system that can carry a current what happens well my electrical conductivity keeps going up that is what I expect I am introducing more carriers it is the semiconductor is becoming more and more like a metal so its electrical conductivity keeps going up. 
However, the SEPE coefficient is very sensitive to carrier concentration. It does not like very high carrier concentration. So, the SEPE coefficient actually starts decreasing. So, at some point you have an optimal of S square sigma, which will give you an optimal in ZT. All right. So, you need to dope it only till this level and no further. Now, thermal conductivity is a little more interesting. The thermal conductivity of a semiconductor has two contributions. So, heat is carried in a semiconductor very little amounts by electrons, but the majority through atomic vibrations, just atoms rattling in the mean positions. Okay. And the sum total of these two is the total thermal conductivity of silicon, let us say for example. Now, the problem is compounded because the overall thermal conductivity is related uh, to the electrical conductivity through what is called the wiedemann franz law, which says that a material with high electrical conductivity is likely to also be a good heat conductor. All right. So, you cannot have a high electrical conductivity and a low thermal conductivity simultaneously in the same material. They are linked by a very uh, microscopic physical process, which says that you know the mechanism which is transporting charge and heat are very similar. So, if one happens to be very efficient, the other must also be very efficient. Okay. So, overall the problem becomes that we want to uh, you know try to boost this number by boosting the Sebe coefficient, the electrical conductivity and by lowering the thermal conductivity, but they are all interrelated. Okay. Now, they are interrelated in bulk materials, but now when you go to nanostructure, if you make something really, really small, what you can do is you can play with length scales in transport, which are there for every property here. And what, as it turns out, the length scales for transport are different for these three properties. So, what do I mean by length scale of transport? If I look at the process of charge conduction, the way in which it works is that I apply a potential difference and in response a charge carrier sets out. So, an electron starts moving in response to a change in potential difference. As it moves, it encounters an obstacle through which impedes its path and there is a process called scattering. So, the electron as it is moving in a straight line like a billiard ball from A to B, so there is something in the path which causes it to scatter. And the sum total of all the scattering processes gives me a resistivity. Otherwise, every material would be a perfect conductor, zero resistivity. Okay. So, the scale over which charge is being tr uh, transported happens to be different from the scale over which heat can be transported. And by introducing a structure which is intermediate between these two length scales, we can start decoupling thermal conductivity from electrical conductivity and the SEBE coefficient. Okay. So, that is really the hypothesis behind all of the work that we have been doing. So, uh, just to look at some numbers, if you have a ZT of 1 at say room temperature and you have an energy source which is at 100 degrees centigrade, then you are looking at an overall conversion efficiency of around 4 percent. Okay. Now, if I could do this with waste heat at 100 degrees centigrade, I would actually take it. But this is only one part of the puzzle. So, this is if everything happened to be ideal. So, today as I said, uh, bismuth telluride is the leading material in thermoelectrics and uh, both the N type and P type versions of bismuth telluride happen to have a ZT somewhere around 0.8 at room temperature. Okay, that is the peak. So, there are still problems with using these materials. Today, um, there are a few other materials which have been looked into and the automobile companies that are working on putting waste heat recovery systems in automobiles. We are actually looking to bismuth telluride, um, some uh, other versions based on antimony etcetera. But all of these have scalability issues because of low abundance of these materials and they happen to be expensive compared to something as abundant as say silicon. Now, silicon has been uh, you know the workhorse of the semiconductor industry primarily because of cost. And the question we asked is what about silicon? Why can't we have silicon here? for doing thermoelectric energy conversion because I have a lot of process technology developed for silicon. I know exactly how to handle it, how to make good contacts, how to engineer a lot of things with silicon. But as it turns out, silicon is a poor thermoelectric material. And the problem is not so much in the electrical transport properties, but in the thermal transport properties. Silicon as it happens is a very good conductor of heat. Right? 
And that basically saves the uh, microelectronics industry a lot of trouble. Silicon can very efficiently dissipate or remove the heat that's being produced by all the transistors. But when it comes to thermoelectrics, that's not something you want. You want it to be a poor conductor of heat. So if I took silicon in bulk, the thermal conductivity is about 150 watt per meter Kelvin, very high at room temperature. And bulk ZT, if I took this and converted this into the parameter Z, which is S square sigma by K, works out to be about 0.01. And I want a ZT of 1, so I have 100 times lower than where I need to be. Okay. So silicon happens to be a poor thermoelectric material. So the trick that we are trying to uh, play here is to reduce the thermal conductivity without affecting the charge transport properties. Okay. And to do this, we uh, you know, have to delve a little bit deeper into the physics of heat conduction. What is the process which is responsible for heat conduction and why do we have a particular value of thermal conductivity? So in silicon, it is the lattice vibrations that are primarily conducting heat. So if we look at a high school physics picture of heat conduction, let's say you have a high temperature source and a cold temperature contact here and there is some material in between which is a single crystal material. So the atoms are all arranged very nicely periodically and in response to this temperature gradient, the atomic vibrations will transfer energy from the hot side to the cold side. So as one atom vibrates, it pulls the neighboring atom with it and so on and energy basically propagates along a chain of atoms. Right? So that is atomistic scale heat conduction. You can think of this equivalently using quantum theory as transport by a gas of fictitious particles. All right? The process is exactly analogous. You can set it up so that it works exactly the same. So instead of worrying about what the atoms are doing, you worry about what these fictitious particles are doing. So think about it as just uh, molecules of gas. And the molecules of gas conduct energy from one end to the other by bouncing off each other, right? Just the process of heat conduction in a gas. So this is a gas, and the particles are called phonons from quantum mechanics. And all our effort is to engineer the transport of these, of these phonons. Okay. So uh, the formalism for understanding this kind of conduction is basically set up in the kinetic theory of matter. Uh, it's basically saying that you know, things happen due to collisions between particles. So there's an interplay between as kinetic energy is being converted into potential energy and back and forth. So from the kinetic theory of matter, thermal conductivity is basically a product of three quantities. Heat capacity of a carrier particle. So in this case, if I have a phonon which is conducting heat, it is the heat capacity of that phonon times the velocity. V is the velocity, the average speed at which the phonon is traveling. And finally, the mean free path, lambda. So lambda, the process can be understood as such. Um, I give someone a packet of letters, and he has to take the letters from point A and deliver it to point B. The number of letters he carries at one time, at each instance, is what I call the heat capacity. Right? The more letters he carries at a time, the more letters he delivers. Speed is obvious, the speed at which he travels. Now as the letter carrier goes from A to B, he is met by other letter carriers or other things which obstruct his path and he scatters, he hits them and they exchange letters. All right. So this process, the average distance he travels before he bumps into somebody is the mean free path. And so for thermal conductivity to be good, you want that average distance to be longer. So he has to travel a large distance before he scatters and that would result in a good thermal conductivity. So what we want to do is the inverse. We want to limit the mean free path. We want to make particles collide as often as possible. Right? That would lower the mean free path and would lower the thermal conductivity. So amongst the processes by which the mean free path is being set up, which are all scattering processes, a phonon, as shown here schematically, can scatter off the boundary of a crystal. So if I have the edge of a crystal, the vibration cannot proceed beyond that edge. So it scatters off that edge. Then it can scatter off another vibration. So one vibration can interact with another vibration because the process happens to be nonlinear. So there are two waves and they will interact. And this is another kind of scattering called phonon-phonon scattering. And finally, everything is happening assuming a very nice perfect crystal. 
So, if there are any defects of any sort, any impurities, any foreign atoms, that also tends to scatter this energy propagation. All right. So, there are these are the three main mechanisms by which uh, phonons are being scattered and thermal conductivity is being limited. So, we want to bump up all the scattering mechanisms. How do we do this? Well, we introduce as many impurities as possible through doping. But the biggest gain is in boundary scattering. So now, if I take a bulk material and I squeeze its boundary, so I make it smaller and smaller and smaller, I get to a scale where the phonon actually is interacting mostly with the boundaries. All right, and this scattering process would give a very short mean free path comparable to the dimension of the structure, because it will only travel across the dimension of the structure. Now, if I imagine that I take a wire which is one centimeter in diameter, the mean free path of silicon at room temperature is about 100 nanometers. So, I would have to shrink the wire all the way to 100 nanometers before the boundary starts mattering. Okay? But once I get to that scale and beyond that, once I suppress the diameter beyond 100 nanometers to let us say 50 nanometers, this mean free path is now being controlled exactly by the dimensions of the structure. No other factors are important anymore. So, by making things very, very small, I can arbitrarily lower thermal conductivity. And if I am careful, the mean free path for electrons happens to be different. So, they are much shorter and so I can do this without affecting charge transport. So, the charge does not see, charge does not see any boundaries being introduced additionally, whereas the heat conduction process sees the influence of the boundaries very strongly. Okay. And by controlling this very carefully, we can get a substantial gain. So, this is basically doing the same, uh, you know, this is illustrating the same principle, but now more numerically. So, this is the mean free path and this is these are the curves which show different ranges of mean free paths for different processes. So, the red process shows uh, indicates impurity scattering. So, this is the mean free path that results from impurity scattering on the x axis is the frequency. So, phonons are waves they have different frequencies and uh, transport is quite like the Planck radiation law. So, you have a whole black body of phonons if you think about it just like radiation. So, there are different frequencies and the whole spectrum conducts heat and where you want to tune is wherever that peak of that spectrum happens to be. So, this is the whole spectrum and this happens to be very high frequency. So, from 0 to about 15 terahertz for silicon, tera is 10 raised to 12. Okay. And finally, there is boundary scattering and then there is the blue uh, trend indicates the phonon phonon scattering. So, what we are trying to do is take a nanowire whose dimensions critical dimensions happen to be 100 nanometers. So, that is the diameter of the wire. So, in this wire vibrations will scatter mostly of the boundaries which will lower their thermal conductivity. And further by making that boundary additionally rough, I bring in a little bit of an exotic effect um, which has to do with coherence or the interaction of waves with each other. But by harnessing this by making the surface rough, I can dramatically lower the thermal conductivity from the bulk value to as low as a few watts per meter Kelvin. So, bulk silicon thermal conductivity is 150 watt per meter Kelvin and till date we have demonstrated thermal conductivities up as low as 3 watt per meter Kelvin with the silicon nanowire whose charge properties are pretty close to that of the bulk. Right? So, this does work. Um, now, I lead a uh, sort of a big effort on campus uh, which is spread not just in my group, but spreads to about five other faculty across campus in electrical engineering, material science and taken together uh, this is what we are trying to build. So, this is a, th this is a thermoelectric generator uh, composed of silicon nanowires. So, we have p type wires shown here schematically. So, these are whole arrays of wires now because one wire only conducts that much and is not very efficient. So, we want something um, on the scale of say uh, millimeters. So, the whole area of this thing is millimeter scale. So, that has you know hundreds of thousands of wires in it. So, there is p type wires, there is n type wires and then we are working on you know characterizing the properties of these wires, putting this device together uh, which requires a lot of uh, ingenuity in making contacts, electrical contacts because those are all very lossy mechanisms. So, even though one wire taken together is very nice but when you want to make a device out of it, you have to work on other problems. So, there is there's the science part and then there is the hardcore engineering part that comes in as well. Right. 
And uh, so anyway, this is an example of a wire array. So this is an SEM uh, image scanning electron micrograph of a wire array. What you are seeing here uh, are wires approximately 100 nanometers in diameter. The aerial coverage, the density of these wires is fairly, fairly good. So it is anywhere from 30 percent to 45 percent. And uh, that for this kind of fabrication process is a very high number. Okay. We can further control the surface roughness very accurately. So if I want a uh, roughness scale which would be the root mean square height of this uh, you know, undulation, uh, we can control it anywhere from a few angstroms to as large as 5 nanometers. Okay. We do not want to go to 5 nanometers. We restrict ourselves to somewhere around 2 nanometers which is where we get our optimum. So the overall a process works as this starting with a single crystal silicon wafer we uh, evaporate a silver film on top of this and then we heat it up which will divide this film. So the film breaks up and the uh, metals form small islands they will just ball up because of a thermodynamic process they want to minimize their free energy so they will ball up and you get something that looks like this. So these are all balls of silver sitting on top of silicon. Then we do an image, uh, an image reversal process which basically um, means that we want to replace the dots of silver with a film of gold where the dots become the missing links. Okay. So you start with an image which looks like this where the blue is the silver. You evaporate gold on top and then you do something called a lift off which basically takes off the silver and leaves the gold film in place. So now starting with dots of silver I end up with a gold film which has holes in it. Okay. So this is a gold film with holes in it. So what you are seeing here is the silicon exposed and this part is the gold. So it is reflecting more in an SEM. And then we expose it to uh, an etching solution which uses the gold in an electroless etching process. It becomes like a galvanic cell and kind of etches wherever that silicon metal interface is sinks down. Okay. So starting with gold on top, the gold sinks down and I am left with wires standing up. And I have a whole array of these wires and I can do this on wafer scale. So I do not, this is not a small scale process, I can really scale this up. And does not require photolithography, a very important aspect of this work. Okay. So this is not, this is a dirty chemistry process, not a you know, clean room fabrication process necessarily. The only clean room process is this evaporation which is basically an e-beam evaporator. So it is done in vacuum. Once we have wires, we want to make devices out of them. So the wires as produced have very smooth surfaces and we want to tailor the roughness to get the exact roughness that I need to get optimum properties. So this is further exposed to a second etching process which produces roughnesses. So what you are looking at is uh, these are all transmission electron micrographs where an electron is passed through the wire and what I am looking at is the image of the electrons after they have gone through the wire. So the darker portion is where the wire is, the lighter portion there is nothing there so all the electrons went through and this is the surface of the wire. Okay. So all this is the wire and this is just happens to be a surface. Now by controlling the roughness we can go all the way from atomic scale to about 5 nanometer, 10 nanometer, 20 nanometer roughness. So I can control the roughness and make the wires as rough as I want them to. I do not want it to be this rough, this is a really bad wire for electrical transport. Once I have a rough wire, we go through a filling process to make sure that this becomes like a thin film effectively. So the wire itself is uh, you know, structurally not perfect, not very good. So we have um, a spin on glass which will fill up this thing and effectively at the end of the process I have a thin film, I have a film of material in which I have wires embedded in a matrix. Finally, uh, we can take these wires and by a process called transfer printing we can move the wires from one substrate to another and make electrical contacts on them. Okay. So that completes the process. We have done extensive characterization of this and in the interest of time I am going to step through this a little bit quicker. But uh, one uh, very important characterization for us is uh, transmission electron micrographs which tells us exactly the level of roughness that is there on this wire. So this is a high resolution image where you are actually zooming in into a very small section of the wire surface. So this is the surface of the wire. And what you are seeing these dots are really the atoms of silicon. So everything here looks very nice and crystalline. So the atoms are in a crystal. I have not disturbed that. So I expect charge transport to be good because that requires crystallinity. 
and this is all amorphous this is amorphous silicon dioxide it's the native oxide that forms on the surface of silicon so this is the interface and we control the roughness at this interface by controlling the times and the etching solutions the concentrations etc we have done electrical characterizations of these wires so this is a single wire that has been uh, we make metallic contacts to and we can uh, you know run a current through them to ensure that we can make first of all an ohmic contact you want to make a very good uh, metal to semiconductor contact and by doping the wire we can reduce the resistivity to about 1 milliohm uh, centimeter which is the typical number you want for a thermoelectric device we also do a lot of uh, single wire thermal characterization so the thermal characterization is a little bit more involved because you want to measure the thermal conductivity of a nanowire which is 100 nanometers in diameter and uh, for thermal engineers in the audience or mechanical engineers the thermal resistance scales inversely as the area so as the cross sectional area is very small the resistance is huge so how do I put enough heat into a wire to measure a temperature difference across the ends all right so what you have to really do here is make it thermally isolated so we do the measurement in vacuum there is no convection and further we suspend it across a micro device such that uh, which is so thermally isolated as shown here so what you are seeing from the top side are beams these are all beams and this space is all empty so this is one island which is formed by etching away removing all material around it and this is a second island that is formed by again removing material between the two islands we suspend a wire um, all this requires is a graduate student and a month of effort to get one wire across but can be done um, after the wire is suspended we make contacts welds to these wires okay this is an incredibly difficult process with a very very poor yield so we are working on improving that but we succeed so if you start with say uh, 50 devices you end up with one that hopefully works but this happens to be the most um, physically uh, insightful measurement that one you can do so this is thermal conductivity of a single wire uh, measured across a whole temperature range the reason we do this temperature dependent measurement is because it tells us about the physics you can't get this by just looking at the room temperature value so the shape of this curve hides a lot of information it hides information about the processes of scattering which are going on inside the wire All right I don't have time to go into that today um, some other time perhaps but there is really a rich information hidden here overall what we see is with a 120 nanometer or these are actually much wider wires these are uh, 100 plus wires the thermal conductivity of an undoped wire is somewhere around 8 to 10 watt per meter Kelvin and by doping this we can reduce it further to about 4 watt per meter Kelvin we also do array scale measurements it is good to measure one wire because that tells you the physics but you want to measure arrays because that tells you about the device you are going to build so with arrays the measurement becomes a little more complicated and uh, this is a system that one of my collaborators has built here David Cahill in material science uh, who is really the world expert in these kinds of measurements so this is called thermoreflectance where you take a thin film and you evaporate a thin metal film on top of that and you use a pulse laser beam to heat up that metal film okay so you come in with a very fast laser very short pulse laser and when the laser hits the metal it produces a small amount of heat in that metal film and the metal film is in contact with the substrate which you want to measure so after the, the film heats up that heat flows down into the substrate and the film starts cooling down you come in with the second laser beam which is time delayed so you control it so that it comes a few picoseconds later and bounces off the same surface but now it is a low power beam and I only look at the reflectance of that beam the reflectivity of the metal is a function of its temperature so as the temperature of the metal is hot its reflectivity is different as it cools down its reflectivity changes so by looking at the reflectivity of the second beam I can figure out the temperature as it evolves in time so effectively I can produce a cooling curve so I heat up this film and it cools off and I can measure that using this apparatus reason why we are doing this and not anything else is because the film happens to be very thin and so at that scale this is the only thing that works really so this is thermal conductivity measured as a function of roughness and what we see is that as I increase the roughness I can indeed lower the thermal conductivity and this happens to be a very fundamental result because a lot of people actually the majority of people in my field never believe that this would happen because things at room temperature are already as rough as they can be that is the you know the understanding that the field has had for a very very long time going back to work done in the 1920s 
So we are trying to revise that assumption and saying that there is an additional physics that kicks in. And so as you increase this roughness, this starts decreasing even further. Okay. Uh, the final thing is uh, what is called a SABIC measurement. So we have I talked about the electrical conductivity measurements, the thermal conductivity measurements. So the reason we are doing all this is because we want to see how good the wires are by putting together the factor Z. Z depends upon S square sigma by K. So I am trying to measure the S sigma and K for these wires. Okay. So I have already measured electrical conductivity sigma. I have measured thermal conductivity K. And this is the final measurement for a SABIC uh, voltage. So in this measurement, we make a film of these wires, as I mentioned, by taking a whole array of wires and filling them up with some material, which acts as a matrix. And we heat up the top surface. And we do this in a, with an AC current. And there is a reason for why we do this with an AC current. Uh, has to do with signal to noise ratio problems that we encounter otherwise. But this is a periodic, steady periodic heating problem. So you are heating this top substrate. And as the heat flows down, it flows down across the wires. And because I have a temperature difference across the wires, there is going to be a Seebeck voltage that is going to be generated. And by measuring that voltage in open circuit, I can figure out what that Seebeck coefficient is. So this is basically showing that. Now in the same measurement, we can also extract the thermal conductivity of the film. Okay. So this is a very um, sort of established method, but we have evolved this to do this kind of Seebeck measurements. So what we find is that the Seebeck coefficient for these arrays are exactly the same as bulk. There is no difference. So the Seebeck is not affected. Electrical conductivity we can dope to get to the level where we want. So eventually the real focus is to lower the thermal conductivity to the level to get the right Z. So where we stand today, we have demonstrated P plus arrays, which is basically P type arrays and N type. You need both in order to be able to make a thermocouple out of these. Uh, with a ZT of about 0.6 at room temperature and for N this is about 0.4 and this is very, very comparable to bismuth telluride. Okay. So the rare earth material that I was talking about. So this is silicon. We started, remember we started with a ZT of 0.01. So we have moved that to 0.61 and 0.44 here. So that's a huge improvement from where things were. Um, in terms of you know things to do, there are still more of device level. Now we are shifting from science to more of engineering where we have to make these devices work really well, engineer the contacts, uh, which is again, it's, a, it's actually a very non-trivial problem in itself. So uh, just to summarize, uh, I wanted to make the point that silicon thermoelectrics, uh, as we understand it today, you know, does have the potential to really break through and uh, meet or beat the materials that are uh, currently, you know, the best in the market. And the idea is to basically enable cost-effective waste heat recovery systems. So these would go into a thermoelectric module, which, you know, uh, requires a lot of engineering, but has been done. So there are systems out there. All this is going to do is this is going to replace the material in those modules that already exist. So our ongoing work has been to... Uh, fabricate not just measure or demonstrate individual wires or arrays but to make a working device and we are about hopefully about six months away from doing that so up till now what we have done we actually have a working device but exactly but it's not been engineered properly so the contacts are not very good so a preliminary characterization uh, shows that the ZTs or the conversion efficiencies of these devices should be fairly good or comparable with uh, you know existing rare earth materials and now our emphasis is going to be on the device engineering, so particularly on the contacts. That's where our focus is going to be. Now, all of this project is funded by ARPA-E, which is Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, which is a newly funded, newly founded agency that was started under the Obama administration. And my collaborators for this work are David Cahill, Nick Fang, who has moved to MIT, Placid Ferreira, the Head of Mechanical Engineering, Schilling Lee in Electrical Engineering, John Rogers in Material Science. And uh, these are some of the students and postdocs working on this project. The postdocs are shown in red just to give them some status apart from the students. And these are some of the students. So we have a very bunch, you know, big bunch of very enthusiastic students working on this project. So with that, I would like to pause and take any questions. Thank you very much. Sure.